It's a response or perhaps a continuation of a discussion that's going on about what religion actually is. Um, <coughs> response, I guess, to suicide for celluloid, um, Corey Anton, and to some people who put stuff in comments. Oh, uh, oh thou art that, of course. Um, uh, Eric Orwall left some interesting comments on my previous video. A lot of people did, but this is one of those videos where, or one of those topics where I almost feel like I have to restrain myself because it's like, oh, I really want to talk about this. So I gotta, I gotta sort of, uh, I don't know, think more clearly and stick to certain points uh, in the hope that the discussion won't peter out and I'll eventually have the time to get out everything that's up here that I want to discuss on this issue. Love this issue. Um, I started out with my point of departure on my original video that religion is a conspiracy. Now, I'm not saying that I believe that. Um, I'm just saying, let's just assume that. And um, Suicide for Sally Lloyd picked up on that. He sort of said, okay, I know that you, you're saying that, let's just, you know, let's say religion is a conspiracy. Now, again, I come out of sort of a free-thinking, kind of atheistic um, point of view, Although I always say that I'm not an atheist, but I do, you know, I sound like one. Um, and I like to sort of begin by saying, let's just say that, let's think negatively about religion. And then go from there. It isn't that I actually have a fundamentally negative view of the whole idea behind it. It's just I want to sort of address people's objections, I guess, from the very beginning. Let's just say that we're going to deal with the fact that uh, people have certain objections, and I've anticipated those ab objections as the point of departure for the, the case I'm putting forward. Um, so that's really, I guess, what I would like to say. I'm not saying that I believe that religion is a conspiracy. Um, I'm just, I, I started from the premise that let's take it as the subject of discussion where, let's say, we're in a debating society, and somebody said, religion is a conspiracy. Discuss. That's it. Um, but that's where I'm coming from. Uh, it's not its not something that I actually believe or strongly believe. I believe in certain elements of that, yes. Um, now, to sort of develop things a bit more, uh, this goes to, I guess, what Matt, oh, thou art, oh, thou art that was uh, his objection. Or not really an objection, but his addition. Um, let's say... Um, something blows you away in life, okay? In a in a way that's hard to sort of put down to just sort of normal stimulus response stuff. Um, one time I remember very distinctly, I was working in an office tower in downtown Toronto around about 1990 or something like this. I was outside, I think I was drinking a cup of coffee, just sitting there vacantly watching the mobs of people walk by. It's right right smack in the middle of downtown Toronto, sort of a very urban environment, skyscrapers everywhere. And suddenly, the, the sky, which was somewhat grayish, got this massive blob of deep blue, sort of slowly creeping across the sky, uh, some kind of a storm front or something like this. Um, it's almost as though the proverbial drop of ink into the uh, into the pool of water. Although in this case, it sort of looked like a drop of dark blue ink into, say, a dish of milk, or, I don't know, some grayish liquid. It's the sky in a certain configuration that you almost never see. Suddenly, everybody is like doing this. Wow. Now, so what? <laughs> it's just a, a, a natural phenomenon. Um, I don't think anyone was frightened by it, but we had never seen this before. It was way up there, it was huge, and it was completely out of the ordinary, and it looked like something was about to happen. Just because of the way the sky looked. What we got was just this massive downpour that lasted about, I don't know, a minute? And then the sky cleared. We've, we've all been through that sort of thing. Now, here on the prairie where I live now, that happens fairly frequently, where you go immediately after a thunderous downpour to clear skies and these big, very distinct clouds. If you're a sky watcher, there's no better place to live than the prairie, by the way. But 
It's the reaction in us that fascinated me, or it still fascinates me. What was that? What was that reaction? Because we get surprised and taken aback by things all the time, but this one was sort of like... Like we were all lifted out of ourselves, and you could see it in other people. It was a really neat experience. This can happen in not necessarily nice circumstances, but I rather suspect that a lot of people who were there on the day uh, in New York City, September the 11th, uh, 2001, when that horrific event took place, a lot of people would have felt a negative sense of awe. A negative sense of <sighs> probably 50, 100 times more potent than what we felt in Toronto on that day. The same sort of thing. Now, I don't think it's simple threat that would make you feel that way, because a lot of the people who sort of saw that, they obviously weren't running away. They were sort of struck dumb by what had happened. And in the same vein, if, say, a mugger came out and thrust <clears throat> a pistol in my face and said, give me your money, I don't think I would have the same kind of wow, uh, sort of reaction as I would if uh, than if I had seen, say, the, the, the Twin Towers come down or whatever. Um, even though with the gun directly in my face, um, I would be in a much greater immediate danger. What I would suggest is, is that, or I would ask, I guess, is that a religious feeling? That sense of the word I like to use, it's um, the numinous. That something truly profound has happened that has taken you by surprise, that you've been transported out of yourself, and you feel completely different. That I can't... You could call that religious. And I, 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 don't, I wouldn't disagree with that. Um... And religion, a religious experience without religion or without anyone sort of, without a shaman, without a, um, without an actual god, it's just this profound feeling, which you would get uh, in, in any number of circumstances. A lot of people, I'm sure, go to see professional sports live for that reason, because they are now part of this gigantic group. Something profound is happening. The very fact that you're sitting there among all these other people is part of the experience. It's not just enough that you're there watching the game. It's part of the experience. Now, I can see how people would want to recreate that. That's why you have adrenaline junkies. That's why you have people joining the French Foreign Legion. That's why you have people um, deliberately uh, engaging in activities such as meditation or whatever in, in order to deliberately bring about some sort of sense of being lifted out of oneself. And I can see how incipient religion would come out of that. You know, just go back to, you know, uh, incipient human beings or whatever, or, you know, early human beings who see that, that thunderous, you know, disturbance up in the sky, a lightning strike. Or they see um, gigantic... Um, stampede of wildebeest or something like this. Just some truly mind-blasting experience that is completely natural. That it's not its not something that, you know, you, you don't have to mystify it. You may even know what it is. Um, you may have seen, you may have heard legends about big lightning strikes or gigantic um, stampedes of animals that take your breath away when you're in the middle of it, especially if you're, you know, if you've ever heard of one of those uh, stampedes where, say, harmless animals stampede, and they just ignore you. They, they sort of run by you. Um, I remember reading about that once in uh, uh, a Trek Boer family in South Africa who had, this is, a, you know, the early 19th century, who was, went through this, and they couldn't believe that this gigantic herd of animals just ignored them. They could have trampled them in their their uh, their wagon to pieces, but they just sat there for hours, I guess, watching these frightened animals going by. That kind of thing takes your breath away, and it will have a profound influence on you. And I guess our reaction to that, that feeling, not so much even the event, but that feeling, 
that feeling of being extremely alive, and it's not just an adrenaline rush. Um, it's something outside of yourself that's taking place, and it has a deep effect on you, and you're not sure if it's a positive or a negative effect, but it has a deep effect on you. I can see how religious sentiment can grow out of that. Um, and, and that can be any number of things. Simply seeing for the first time, say, if you've ever, ever never seen the Great Plains where I live, the first time you see the vast expanses of nothingness, I guess, it can take your breath away. And it can make you feel small, and but small in a very profound and numinous kind of way. Um, so yeah, I, that's that could be religion, and that's not a conspiracy. That's just a naturally occurring thing, where you just go... And <clears throat> who can blame people for wanting to sort of explore that and find ways to sort of maybe even recreate it because that's a truly intoxicating kind of feeling. Um, and it's, uh, I, I like uh, Suicide for Sally Lloyd's exploration or questioning of belief. Do we believe what we believe? Or do we just believe that we believe what we, what we say that we believe? We tell ourselves that we believe this and, you know, how do we test our own, the strength of our own beliefs, uh, except for in maybe crude ways of having people challenge them? Um, you know, it's a uh, it's it's a tricky thing, belief. Um, and as you say, uh, you, uh, a lot of people at the very top may simultaneously believe and not believe what they're doing, what they're propagating. They may see the necessity of it. They may, in some sense, believe it. But in other it, the 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 mode of force behind everything that they do has nothing to do with any belief. They'll say that this is just a necessary thing that I have to do for society. The point I was sort of uh, making was, say religions did start off as something phony, where it's a witch doctor bamboozling his, his uh, fellow, I don't know, uh, nomads or whatever, hunter-gatherers. Even if it starts out that way, does it necessarily stay that way? Is it, you know, does the very fact that say that religion had an imperfect beginning, does that negate all of it? Does that negate everything that ever flowed from it? Um, I still, uh, you know, I'd love to discuss this with Eric Orwell. Maybe I, I will be able to, to do so at, uh, you know, further videos. But I still kind of believe that at least um, caste Hinduism began as something of a conspiracy, something of a political act. And yet, caste his Hinduism, because of its rigidity, because of the conspiracy, created uh, a caste of self-sustaining priests who had the leisure to sit around and think about things like uh, uh, Brahman, Atman, um, do things like compile the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads or the Puranas or whatever. The very fact that there was... Uh, this unfair system created the leisure necessary for people to sit around and speculate. Um, paradox. You sort of say, okay, this is terrible what these people have done. They've created a warped system in which um, not only are the warriors and priests sort of standing on everyone else's shoulders and forcing them to work for them, but they're also um, brainwashing them with a pile of rubbish that's just designed to keep them in their place. And even more, I guess, uh, thoroughgoing example of that is the uh, the fellahin of the the Nile Delta uh, in ancient Egypt. The entire edifice of ancient Egyptian religion looks, if you look at it a certain way, uh, designed to simply keep them down on the farm, to keep the grain and the fish and the the bricks flooding into the cities, where a bunch of people just live this high life. And in return for the produ produce of their labor, the fellahin, the peasants, get God. They get religion. Um, but I had this discussion once with a more or less militant atheist. I would say we don't have any way of gauging whether or not the, the fellahin have been ripped off. We, don't, we, we can't really say that <clears throat> what they get in return for the fruits of their labor is not worth what... <laughs> Um, what they've given. I hand my harvest to a bunch of priests who hand me back uh, 
a bunch of incantations and uh, and songs and maybe an image of a god. Um, you know, who got the raw deal here? <laughs> How can we actually judge that? Well, of course, we know that the religion is uh, BS, so of course the, 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 the peasant has been ripped off because he, he gave something tangible to these priests who don't believe in any of it. They gave him a bunch of rubbish, and he does believe in it. So of course he's being ripped off. Is he? <laughs> um, you, you could even argue that it's, it's the, the priest who's getting ripped off because he, he now gets to stuff his face and feed his gross appetites for, you know, wine, women, and song or whatever. And uh, the, the the peasant, the the fella, he gets uh, he gets meaning. <laughs> um, it's a strange sort of debate to get into, and it gets people angry when you start <laughs> discussing stuff like this because the, the hatred of priests in our society, I think, runs fairly deep, um, and it's not just confined to atheists either. Uh, I come from the Irish Catholic community, and uh, the however profoundly Catholic the Irish might be, there's a strong suspicion, maybe not so much about the parish priest, but anybody above him, it's probably not the best person, probably a nasty guy, the evil bishop, or, you know, the, the nasty, uh, the nasty uh, cardinal, or, you know, the, the, the black-robed uh, Jesuit, or something like that. It's a sort of figure of, uh, of uh, evil in Irish Catholic thinking even though they're very Catholic. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, even if it is a conspiracy, is it is it a conspiracy that only benefits one side? Um, and, you know, it, uh, I'm not really sure that we can answer that, because we that, that goes to the question of value, that goes to the question of belief. What if you get something to believe in and it makes sense out of your life um, whereas in return all you're doing is you're creating a jaded uh, nobody who you know again has nothing to do with but feed his appetites and then die and he can say that boy life really didn't add up to a lot um, whereas the, the 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 peasant say even in the Ganges uh, River Valley uh, or the plain really uh, got ripped off uh, overtly by the Brahmins who then created the Bhagavad Gita, which would have actually, if you ask me, uh, truly given people an enormous amount of meaning. I don't follow any religion at all, but I still get a real oomph out of the Gita and out of the Upanishads and out of other religious texts. Texts, I think me and um, Got That Funk have that in, in common. Uh, you don't have to believe in any of this stuff to get a lot of um, a lot of numinosity, I don't know, out of it. Um, I have copies of the Gita here. I have copies of uh, books on I Indian philosophy. I have the Upanishads by Juan Mascaro, which I read uh, as probably poetry a lot. But it does trigger something in here that suspiciously does resemble that feeling that I got when I stared up at the blue streak across the sky tons more to discuss on this subject, um, and uh, I've already gone beyond the <laughs> limits that I'd set myself today, but uh, hopefully we can keep this going. Uh, a, a, something I really, really, really am passionate about. I, I, I love this issue. <laughs>